We're going to start in the book of Acts chapter 4, but I'm going to talk to you about Acts chapter 3. See, in Acts chapter 3, there was an action that took place. In Acts chapter 4 was the reaction to it. They say with every action comes a reaction. So at this point, you, you have this moment in Acts the third chapter with Peter and John. And I love the fact that these men had that fellowship together with Jesus for three years and John the Beloved hanging out with Jesus. And here's, you know, the brother of James. And here, here comes Peter and they connect. They probably don't have a lot in common except Jesus. I haven't realized that a lot of us don't have a lot in common except Jesus. But Jesus is enough. Everybody say Jesus is enough. So because of that, they're on their way to, the, to pray. Now, here's the thing. You can decide if you want to pray for somebody, witness to somebody, share the love of God with somebody. But if you do, understand there may be a reaction from it. And this is what we're after because the reaction actually led, if I say 5,000, 5,000 people to Christ. One reaction caused 5,000 people to get born again. This is an amazing story. So Peter and John at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm talking out of Acts chapter 3. I'm going to narrate it for you because I've got a lot to read out of chapter 4. But they're on their way, and, and, and uh, says, if I don't get through with this sermon, don't panic, okay, because there's a lot to go through right here. But the neat thing is, it's on their way there to pray, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Peter and John see a man begging for, for food. He's begging for money. Actually, he wants money. How I many know that most folk beg want money? Amen. So they can buy beer, or drugs, or, or food, or diapers. I'm not, I'm not just throwing disparity. I'm just saying he's out of place. But now, in this case, he's 40 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call him Sloppy Joe. Slop, slop, Sloppy Joe. How about that? So Sloppy Joe every day gets carried to the temple. He sits at the temple, and there at the temple he begs for money. The Greek word is alms, A-L-M-S. He's begging for alms. He's asking for help. And he, as he's asking for help, and th this hit me, I, I know a couple of years ago, I, I made mention of this in a, in a sermon. Somebody had to bring him there. Somebody had to pick him up, take him home. So when I think of that, I'm thinking of this also. Somebody's getting a cut. Somebody's making money off of bringing Sloppy Joe to the, to the church, dropping him off in front of everybody. So here is, the, and, and to drop off in front of the church brings what? Sympathy. You feel, because aren't we believers in Christ? Aren't we supposed to feel for people? Amen. And so here he's there, and so, they, so he's probably making a pretty good cut six, seven days a week. On this day, they went daily to prayer. So I mean, church going on seven days. So here Peter and John are walking through there, and Sloppy Joe's asking for money. Give me some money. And at that moment, Peter says to him, the, the message Bible says it like this. Peter said, I don't have a nickel. Now, that's really not true. They had finances. Amen. They had a treasure. But the bottom line is he was saying to him, money ain't going to help you right now. I mean, realize that money doesn't always help you. Amen. When you're in a situation, first off, you need friends, you need relationship, you need God. You need something that's inside that church, not on the outside that church. So as they're walking in, they look at the man, he's yelling, arms, arms for the poor, help me out, give me some money, I need something here. Six days a week, man, seven days a week he's doing this. And Peter looks down at him, and, he, and, and the King James says, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, we're going to give to you. Every one of you have a such as we have. Everybody here got a such as we have. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is dwelling in you as a believer. Well, you say, I don't know, God. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a young Christian, young. I don't know for sure. I've had failures in my life. Christ is in you if you are a believer. So you got as such as you have. That's what you got inside of you. So he says, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm going to tell you where he's from, man. He's from Nazareth. Rise up and walk. The Bible says Sloppy Joe grabbed hold of that hand and he lifted him up. He received strength in his legs and began to walk. He began to leap. He began to dance. There was something amazing about what just happened right there. This is Acts 3. This is an action, man. Something just took place. Peter and John, now they didn't make no big fanfare out of it. They just went on into the church. Guess what? He hugged them, held them, and went into the church with them. So now they're all in church together. Now everybody knows. 
about Sloppy Joe. That he's been there for four, 40 years from the time they could take him there. He's been there for over, everybody knows him. The Sadducees knew him, the Pharisees knew him, the Herodians knew him. They knew him in the temple, amen. They knew him in the courts. The government knew of him. They brought him in, and they began to rejoice. Then Peter, I love Pete. Man, he took a moment there to preach, and he said to all the people that showed up in that church, you know, y'all the ones that crucified Jesus. And it was Jesus raised this man up from, from uh, gave him back his legs. It's a powerful story. Now, Sloppy Joe, man, he's excited. He didn't, run, he didn't go home. He hung out with them. Chapter 3, chapter 4. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now, this bothered them simply because they had tried to act like Jesus hadn't resurrected, that somebody stole his body, amen, that, that it, all this stuff went down. But everybody already knows that Jesus resurrected. He already met with people in the book of Acts chapter 1, amen. He met with the disciples several times after his resurrection. So they, they were disturbed, verse 3. They grabbed Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. So they got to stay in jail overnight. But many who heard the message believed. Not everyone, but many. Heard it, believed. And the number of men grew to about 5,000. So if the Scripture says 5,000 men, that don't include the women and the children. So now we probably got 15,000. We, we got a, a, a riot. We got, a, we got people out there loving God, amen, that has came to him. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Shouldn't ask that. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, Rulers, elders of the people, if we be in call to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the way, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. The man's still there, Sloppy Joe, right there. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. You need to get that in your crawl. All you teenagers that are hearing other stuff, all you adults that are hearing other stuff, you need to get that in your crawl. There is no other name that's going to get you to heaven except the name of Jesus. And as Peter said, by the way, from Nazareth, amen, the one you crucified, hallelujah, that God God raised from the dead. I mean, he's laying it out. He's got, you're talking about the power to speak boldly. This is the power of the Holy Ghost. When you get filled, when you ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost, not only do you get love, you get boldness. Amen. And they begin to speak truth boldly to the people. Then what, what are we doing? Within, so they, they ordered it. Well, let me back up and find where I'm at. Uh, seven, eight, seven, eight, nine, oh, verse 13. 13. Verse 13. I, I put it in bold. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. One place calls them unlearned and ignorant. Unlearned means you don't know. Ignorant means you don't know you don't know. And when you don't know you don't know, you just go ahead and share what you know. So these men started sharing what they know. And they had been with Jesus. And this is where I hit things. And I'm not against uh, education. And I'm not against graduation. I've, I've got, I'm a Bible college graduate myself. And, and, uh, but I can tell you this much. If you're full of God and you've been reading the Scripture and God dumps wisdom in you, it, it's far greater than, than some of the uh, nonsense being pumped in our colleges. Amen. So when I read this, I'm saying don't discard yourself because you don't have a degree or if you've not studied, you've not read the Bible from front to back. Amen. Don't, don't beat yourself up. Just thank God that God is in you. Amen. Such as I have is inside you. Hallelujah. That, that's what's important here. But since they could see, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. This, this is what hit me. He's standing there. He ain't sitting. 
He ain't squat. He got calluses on his butt from sitting for 40 years. But not this time. He's standing. I, I bet he stood for days. I bet it was hard for him to sit down. Oh, Sloppy Joe was having a good time. He was Peter and John. He getting all the attention now. You know, for before when you're down and everybody knows you're down and you're begging for stuff, everybody kind of bypasses you. But now he's the man. Huh? He's the man. He's the man that got healed only because he asked for it and Jesus did it. Hallelujah. Keep reading, preach. Okay. This is fun. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. They said, what, what are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows. Everybody knows what they have done. An outstanding miracle. We cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we got to tell folk, don't you speak no longer to anyone in his name. This sounds almost like some of the governments I know. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, both of them, replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who had been miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John, they went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. In other words, you set this thing up, God. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word boldly. Come on, somebody shout in this house. Come on, somebody shout in this house. Hallelujah. Amen. When I read this, man, it hit me. These men were already filled with the Holy Ghost. These men had already received the gift of the Spirit of God. Amen. And yet now they got refilled. You know why you get refilled? Because we leak. Oh, Woo, we leak on Thanksgiving. We leak during the week during the working. We leak dealing with people crazy, knock, knuckleheads. Amen. We leak. It just begins to leak out. And every now and then we got to stand before the Father and say, Fill me again, God. Amen. Give me boldness. Give me love. Give me the presence of God in my life. Fill me again. Got to get an amen? amen? There's a purpose here. Peter said, Lord, I, I need you filling. I, and, and after they finished praying, God just came in and began to shake the place. Every now and then God just kind of shakes things up, don't he? Amen. He, and I, I couldn't think what the title is. A shake, rattle, and roll. I didn't know whether to say an action, reaction. I didn't know how, you know, so I just called it, you know, uh, pray and then stretch because that's what's going to happen here. They began to pray, and when they prayed, God stretched them. Hallelujah. And here's this man healed. Can't get over Sloppy Joe. As a matter of fact, Sloppy Joe came in my dreams last night. I woke up this morning, and I wrote it down in my, in my notes real quick because I thought, you know, I got to give that man a name. Every now and then, he just can't be old crippled one. Hallelujah. A man, you know, he turned around, he asked for arms, and he got legs. How about that? Is that a cool thing? Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes you ask for one thing, you get something better. Can I get an amen? Amen. So what Peter learned from this experience, First Peter 4. So Peter later wrote this down. He said, the end of all things is near. What, what I picked up out of these two passages is the urgency of the days and the times in which we live and how many times we forget that life is going to take us quickly. We don't realize how quick life is. Um, I got a call from a friend of mine whose mother passed. I'll do that funeral this week. My son-in-law, Johnny, uh, he, he has a bonus mom, a woman that raised him. He's been bringing her to church now for six months. Hey, man, she's been sitting in there. Her name's Ann, and uh, she passed away last night. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, yesterday night. 
And yesterday, is there yesterday night? Yes. Yeah, sure it is. Amen. If there's an ex-husband-in-law, there sure has got to be a uh, yesterday night. Amen. So the end of all things is near, Peter said. Therefore, be clear-minded, self-controlled, so you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hmm. <laughs> that ought to get y'all to repent after Thanksgiving. Offer hospitality without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So when I read in the book of Acts what Peter did, my mind as a pastor, preacher, I always come over here and find out what does Peter say about it. And realize this, that miracles didn't just continually happen, but every now and then one would happen. Do you realize this man sat by that gate? The Bible says he's 40 years old. He probably was there for over 25 years. Somebody brought him in. Somebody brought him out. By the way, when he got well, how many know there's those that brought him in, brought him out, took a cut of what he made, lost their money? Amen. I like when I hear that those have been using people lose their money. Amen. That's a good thing. So this, this happened, you know. So, so Sloppy Joe, he goes on with his life here. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, now what? And then so Peter goes on and he tells us what we ought to do. When time is short, things get urgent. There needs to be an urgency about us. Amen. There needs to be an urgency for our children. And I was at the, uh, the, the Thanksgiving service here in Crosby. It was well attended, I believe, and uh, I also believe in the name of the Lord it was, well, it was well done. Amen. But there was an urgency about the kids here in Crosby and in our, in our schools in Dayton and Channel View. Amen. Uh, and Huffman to, to, to help them, to be a blessing to them, but also to help them understand. They, they had a hard times. Amen. And we're going to leave this to them. So there needs to be an urgency, and that's what Peter is saying here. Knowing a, a friend or family member hasn't got long to live, your time together is precious. Your discussions return to basics. Amen. Uh, you know, a pastor said to me, now that you've been in ministry now for almost 30 years, at, at this age, what's next for you? And I said, it hasn't changed. It's still win the loss, integrate people, and nurture people. Amen. It hasn't changed. I believe I, I'm going to keep doing that. If that's important. I need to be with family. I need to be with friends. I need to be a grandpa. Amen. These are the urgencies in my life. When you know time is short, and that's what Peter's saying here, the situation is urgent. The mission is simple. When Jesus knew his time was short, he got down to business. When you know that you know. And, and listen, I have had hard talks with family members. I've had hard talks with people in this house. There are times you get where time gets short, and you know it's short. And when you know, and I'm, I'm saying, well, I'm not saying not a week, two weeks. I'm saying if you know you only got years to live here, Amen. Start making preparations for departure. Oh, get quiet on me. Go ahead. Amen. But I'll remind your family when I do your funeral that I told y'all to get your stuff together. Come on. Somebody give me an amen. Preachers don't always talk this way, but your pastor does. Matthew 16, verse 21 says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Boy, this hit me, and suffer. Whew. I mean, he knew. He was going to suffer. See, I don't know in my life how much suffering I got till I go, but I know he took the suffering for me for my salvation. Amen. I know he did that, and he's admitting it here to his disciples. Many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests. I'm going to tell you who's going to hurt me. The elders, the church folk are going to hurt me. The chief priests are going to hurt me. Amen. The teachers of the law, the preachers are going to hurt me, and they must, and, they, and that they, then they're going to kill me. Amen. On the third day, I'm going to tell you I'm going to rise from the grave. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Come on. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. In other words, I don't need you to stop what's fixing to happen. I don't need you to make me stumble about this salvation. I came here for a reason. Of Though I may be on the edge, I'm just over 33. I know that I'm fixing to leave this place. He said, get behind me. Amen. You're stumbling about. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You're just thinking earthly. you got to start thinking eternal. Amen. Eternal things about where we go and how we leave in this place. you got to get your stuff together. i got to suffer. Amen. Before I leave here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he got to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Hmm. 
This seemed to suit Peter just fine. After the Holy Ghost altercation, Peter lived with an eternity fixed to his heart. If an urgent situation demanded action, Peter wasn't one to call for a committee to study the alternatives. Peter didn't sit back and look at John and say, John, should we pray for this guy? Amen. Should we help Sloppy Joe out? Did you know we've been passing by this thing every day? Every day we pass by and Sloppy Joe got his hand out. Every day we've been going to the temple. We've been praying in the temple. But on this day, everybody say this day. You never know when your this day's coming. You don't know when that day of healing's coming, Mike. You don't know when the healing's coming. It, it, it may go on for a while, then boom, something happened. Somebody pray over you. Somebody been planting seeds. Somebody been watering. But on the moment your faith rises, everything connects. Amen. Boom, there's a healing takes place. And on that day, Sloppy Joe gets up from his, from his spot. Amen. Oh, my God. You know what it's like to stretch after being in a vehicle for 10 hours? You get out. You know, you know, you got to gas that truck up. And when I when I when I go places, I don't mind going alone. And that that happened to me. And I drive, I'll drive till that thing's on empty. I will take off, and I drove that truck till it was on empty. And I slid out of that seat. And I stressed. I heard things going. You know, and I'm oh, and I'm, I'm, I make this, I make these death moans. Oh! I don't care who's around me. I got to get it out. Amen. I'm going to groan. I can't imagine how sloppy Joe, when he got up, after all them years, and them bones began to work again, that sinew wrapped around his leg, and the muscle began to form. It's an absolutely God miracle. Amen. And then his excitement. There's one place in the Scripture that says he was leaping. Not only could he walk, but he could jump. Amen. He could get airborne. Hallelujah. He, 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 he jumping up in the air. He, honest to God, he has no need for shoes. He has no need for shoes. He probably barefooted in the church, running up and down the aisles, just a swinging. Hallelujah. Amen. So the situation is urgent. People need help. The mission is simple. Peter said, Peter, I've been with Jesus. Amen. He said in verse 13, 1 Peter 4, 11 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Use good judgment. Stay calm in the spirit of prayer. In other words, at times you just need to chill. Stay cool. Don't panic. Realize God is in control. But, Pastor, you don't saw, you don't saw the results of the, uh, of the election. Stay cool. Chill. Don't panic. God is in control. Amen. He going to raise them up. He going to tear them down. Hallelujah. You just remind yourself you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. So it clear, to be clear-minded means sober, not living in a frenzy. You know what a frenzy is? Not being able to, 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 to go A, B, C, D. You go A to M, back to Z, and all of a sudden you threw a four in the alphabet. alphabet. You messed everything up. You're in a frenzy. You know, you just, you can't, calm down. God got this. He's going to take care of it. Be self-controlled, not in a panic or in anxiety over the future. Control yourself. Well, I don't know what the future. Pastor, you just told me to get things ready. I know. I did. I, I'm getting things ready. But I'm, I may not be here for another 20, I may be here 28 more years. Amen. I don't know. But I know that Peter, as a young man, didn't make it to the age of 50. And he's saying here, get your stuff together. Amen. Get your stuff together. The end is near. In other words, you may not die, but he may show up. So get your stuff together. He may not die. There's a lot of heathens I'd like to leave some stuff with when he takes me up in the rapture. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Amen. So he said, be that way. So don't, don't quit your job. You know, Jesus is coming. I got equipment. Don't quit your job. Amen. You need to keep working. Amen. You, you don't, don't put on a white robe. Amen. Don't, don't, don't go sit on a rooftop waiting on Jesus to show up. Amen. Don't think you have to know every detail of the end times in order to feel secure. Well, I've been reading John Hagee's stuff about the end times from, from, from Alpha to Omega. When he's coming, the vows are going to open, and this is going to happen. Okay. All that's going to happen with or without you. Amen. Listen, your football team might have won yesterday, but it had nothing to do with you. Your football team might have lost yesterday, but it had nothing to do with you. You hear me? Amen. So as I look at it, God's going to do a whole lot of stuff, whether I know about it or not. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to know everything. 
I like surprises. I told Cindy and Pat a while ago, last night I almost shot your dog. See, I got a coyote running on the property. Man, he's all over the place. See, I, he's, I got pictures of him right there, right, uh, uh, 150 yards from my house. And uh, so he, he's, he's a big coyote, too. And uh, he's aggravating. I, and I'm hopefully getting him eventually. Amen. But last night, about 1030, I left my gun out in my truck. I know so y'all don't always carry your gun. But, but I had my gun out in my truck because I was going through Mississippi. So I went out there to get my gun. And I didn't want to leave it in my truck. So as I'm going out to get my gun, I get my gun and, and Pat and Cindy got this old German shepherd named Sacha. And uh, I don't know why she don't stay over there, but she, so I, it, but she, it's dark outside, dark. And I have a gun in my hand, and I turn around, and she's right there. And I can't tell if that's a coyote or a Sacha. And all I did was yell, Sacha, go home. And she took off home and went, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Because I almost shot that dog. Sometimes you got to stay calm, amen? you got to be a little clear. I'd, I'd hate to get here this morning and look at Pat and Cindy go, got your dog last night. <laughs> amen. Don't quit your job. We can pray. You can stay balanced. Let me keep reading here just a little bit more, and then we'll close. Amen. Stay fervent in love for one another. Peter said, I want you to stay calm. The end is coming. It's getting near. Whether you leave it or he's coming, it's, it's getting near. So pray and stretch and hear me. Stay fervent in love for one another. This principle, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. You've heard me say a hundred times, trust God, love people. Learn how to cover over. You don't have, just because you know don't mean you've got to say it. Just because you know about somebody's failures, misgivings, or shortcomings don't mean you've got to share it. Amen. Quit digging for secrets so you can share it. To make yourself feel better about your sins. Don't you do it. Don't you? He said, love fervently. Cover. Cover. Which means you don't talk about it. Hey, Amen. I've been, you know, I, many of you know I wear bandanas and I've been wearing them for 20 years. I started wearing them to teach people to cover, to cover one another. The other thing I use it for is for prayer. The other thing, it keeps sweat from running down my back. And a good hard storm outside, I can flip that thing, cover my nose, Kenny, and keep the dust out. I was wearing masks long before COVID. Fervent. He says the word fervent. It speaks of intensity, determination. The Greek word strained. Strained, stretched. Amen. Like a runner straining to reach the tape. An idea of stretching yourself to love others. Do you know some folk, you've got to stretch yourself to love them? I said you've got to stretch yourself to love them. A pastor I know, that's my son. <laughs> But stretch yourself to love them. Love that girl, man. That's the only thing. Love that girl. Stretch yourself to love them. Amen. Don't just tolerate. Learn how to love. Above all. Above all. When it says above all, it means above everything else. Everything you know about their past, above all. Their financial situation, above all. Their sickness, above all. The fact they pull on you and pull on you above all. Spend your time building people up. Staying fervent in love. Amen. Straining for love. If there's ever a time to stretch our love for one another, and how is love revealed? Cover it. Forgiving. I'll spend the rest of my life asking folk to forgive one another, to release one another. Last Sunday, it was one week ago today, I had people that were embracing and hugging me that I could have struggled forgiving them for their mouth and talking and saying things about me and my church. And yet I embraced them. And I leave a free man. Forgiveness, such a powerful force, isn't it? And only you can do it. Only you can do it. I can't make people forgive me, but I can forgive them. And I can be set free from them. It's such a powerful thing. So he said, above all, amen, cover them, forgive them. Why? Proverbs 10, 12. He pulls it right out of there. Hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers over all wrongs. Hate. Man, you want to stay married? Then you've got to learn how to cover. Amen. you you got to quit stirring up dissension. You know what the word hate, stirring up dissension, you know what dissension is? It's in buttons they know about. And nobody knows your buttons like those folk you've been living with. They know your buttons. Amen. 
I always tell folk, hide your buttons. But some of y'all, y'all put a ribbon around your button. It's their folk to push it. So you can post just how of a bad dude you are, how of a bad woman you are. Amen. You just won't tell everybody. Amen. Well, you're showing more buttons there. Nothing is greater witness than express love and unity of believers. What makes this church such a wonderful church? Y'all love one another. But I look up on the, on the platform, I saw the people here. I didn't know how this thing was going to go when Josiah told me he was leaving. But these folk all love one another. We're family, man. We, we do things together. We hang out together. Nothing is greater. Nothing is more disturbing or disruptive to unity than believers who are stirred up or causes strife in the body. When pastors call me and they tell me, Pastor, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got this group against that group. They're stirring up strife and this, that, and the other. And I say, son, eventually somebody got to go or somebody got to forgive. Amen. It's either it's somebody got to go or somebody got to forgive. Because if not, it's going to destroy your church. It'll eat it up like a cancer, man. Thank God for this house. We've all had reasons to blame. What we need most is a steady stream of love flowing among us. Love that quickly forgives, willingly overlooks, and refuses to take offense. So stretch. When you're praying, you got to stretch. Because God will bring into your mind people. I'm going to say this to you very fast here. Forgive quickly. Because if you don't forgive quickly, you will dwell on it. You will dream on it. You will text on it. You will email on it. You will talk on it. And it will keep. Forgive quickly. And you can let it go quickly. Amen. So I just went from sloppy Joe. Being healed. What happened then? You know, I, I never read where Peter, John, any of the disciples, or Christ held unforgiveness against those that put them in jail. Those who beat them. Though Paul was tortured, amen, I never read where he held any unforgiveness against them. We get the slightest slight, and we hold it for years. Release it and let it go in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this house. Thank you for our young guest here today. I thank you for those that are watching online. And I say to them, stretch. Pray stretch. Stretch in the area of hospitality. Stretch in the area of forgiveness. Amen. Learn how to love one another. Stretch. When you pray, stretch. Every action causes a reaction. When a sloppy Joe gets healed, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people in this city could come to know you if that one person that we've been passing by over and over and over again, we finally give assistance to pray over them and such as we have and God I thank you that I got a house full of people here that's full of such as we have in Jesus name amen